Well, welcome everyone to um, this week's Keeping Current. It's uh, a joy to see you here today on this beautiful spring day. What are you doing inside? And uh, <laughs> some of you might actually be sitting outside. Today we have a guest speaker, Mary Ann Fields, who is a program manager at the Army Research Office, who will be telling us about uh, long-term autonomy, something I've been struggling for all my life. So <laughs> take it away, Mary Ann. Okay, and I'm gonna share slides. Yes, you should be able to do that. Do you see slides yet? What we see is just the header, but oh, we okay. do see something. There, now we see uh, the whole um, uh, PowerPoint screen. There we go. And now we see it, that's perfect. Okay, um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as, as you said, my name is Marianne Fields and I'm the program manager for Intelligent Cyber Physical Systems. And this is the outline of my talk. And basically, I'm going to give you an introduction to the type of research that uh, I'm funding under long-term operations and long-term autonomy. Um, and I'm going to make the assumption here that some of you may not be familiar with either the Army Research Office or the Army Research Laboratory. So I'm going to bracket my talk with some information about both of those. Uh, I pulled this definition out of um, Google, and I think it's pretty appropriate, is long-term autonomy is the ability to operate autonomously under no or minimal supervision for days, weeks, months, or even years. So keep that in mind. That sort of sets the direction of what we want to talk about. Okay, uh, I work for the Army Research Laboratory, and it's, it basically does some really cool stuff in a lot of really neat places. Um, the two primary locations are in Adelphi and Aberdeen, Maryland. I was stationed at Aberdeen, Maryland for almost 30 years. Uh, I, I used stationed, I've, I've always been a Army civilian employee, but just to, to bear in mind. Um, but let's see, before I forget. Um, some of the things that the Army Research Lab does is it, it, it actually has scientists at both of these locations that do work in sensors, materials, robotics, and several other disciplines. Uh, we do have a number of labs across the country, and I encourage you to look at our website and learn more about ARL. Um, sorry they're in yellow, but there are websites on each of these slides, and you all do have access to the slides. Um, the Army Research Office, um, our mission is to drive the cutting edge and disruptive scientific discoveries that will enable future Army capabilities. And we're trying to fund high risk, high payoff, basic research in our, in our uh, work. Uh, we consist of three divisions, and you'll see them here. I work for the Information Sciences Division. Okay. Within the information sciences division, and this is probably more information than you want to know, but it, it, it gives me a nice flow. I work for the computing sciences branch. Um, as you can see, we've got entire uh, intelligence cyber physical systems there at the bottom highlighted in yellow. But we also have other areas such as uh, computer visualization, information fusion, and knowledge systems. Um, and again, You'll have access to these slides if you want to look up some stuff. Let's go on to the main part of the talk. And long-term autonomy, uh, it, throughout the history of robotics, the first thing that we did was develop these factory robotic systems. And there to the point, they can do some very, very cool things to help manufacture products. Um, but one of the things that we were interested in doing is going beyond that and taking the robot out of the factory setting and putting it in what we like to call the unstructured environment or the open world. So the, the question is, is once you do that, 
uh, what happens? Well, just like people, they're going to encounter previously unseen environments, objects and activities and context. And they have to adapt to changing internal and external conditions. They have to adapt to new information and they have to be able to solve new and often complex problems. And one thing that distinguishes um, robotics that I talk about from factory, factory floor robotics is we don't have the luxury of being able to engineer the environment to solve the problem. We have to deal with the environment as it is and engineer the robot to solve the problem. Okay. So you might ask, why does the Army care? Well, the Army cares, um, and they've been funding robotics for the better part of two, probably three decades now. And they want robots that will help the soldiers accomplish their mission. And the mission's changing. And two very important aspects that are coming online is a concept called multi-domain operations, which is a realization that we don't have the luxury of fighting in a single domain. A unit of soldiers is gonna to have to fight in, on the ground, in the air, uh, in space and in cyber simultaneously. And oh, by the way, in the future, they will probably be isolated for extended periods of time, which might extend to up to 72 hours. If the robots are gonna to contribute to that mission, they have to have the ability to also operate for that period of time. Another extremely challenging environment that the, the Army is going to have to face in the future is urban and complex terrains. Um, you probably don't think about the urban environment very often, but if you do, um, consider this from a conflict point of view. Uh, it's a three-dimensional surface where it's not, it, it's very disconnected. There's, um, there's high rises, there's tall buildings that could, could present problems or opportunities. There's underground, there's broken terrain, um, and there's all kinds of people in that environment, some of which uh, you wanna engage with, some of which you wanna protect. So how do you work in that challenging environment? Robots might be part of that solution. ARL actually has a pretty long history in robotics. And what this chart demonstrates is across the bottom are some of the programs we've run over the years. Um, I started actually, I've got demo three on here. I actually started uh, working on robotics in the demo two days. Um, and we've done some remarkable things in this space. We've developed uh, new planning algorithms, um, we developed the idea of anytime planning for those of you you are familiar with that concept. Um, perceptions coming along, um, you know, and interaction with humans is coming along. But I got a question to ask you: What have we really done here? And this is a case where we've done a lot of remarkable parts. We've, uh, you know, our our planning algorithms are getting better. Um, autonomous navigation is getting better and you can do it on roads now. Google keeps demonstrating to us that they can, they can drive for long periods of time. Um, and we can interact for, for short periods of time. But I, I want to challenge you to think about something I call the 10-minute the problem in robotics. And that's the, the, the idea of if you've ever observed robotic experiments, have you ever seen one that lasts longer than 10 minutes? I mean, I've been to a lot of them and there are not a lot of exercises that last longer than 10 minutes. Um, and if that's our focus, we'll never get to a system the army can feel. because there's a lot of things you leave out if you only have to operate for 10 minutes. And I think if we're going to uh, support long-term autonomy, we need research in the following areas. 
First of all, knowledge, representation, reasoning, and decision making. We need to make some advances in that area. Learning theory, particularly for the online environment. And we need uh, assured operations. If we want a robot to last for a long time, it has to be reliable. And then finally, there's really no such thing as a completely autonomous system. You have to interact with other entities, be they robots or humans, uh, be they um, on your side or on some other side. You have to interact in a long-term environment and We've got some technology, but we don't have enough in this area. Within knowledge representation and reasoning, um, there's, there's some areas that uh, impact long-term robotics. The first one is a very important problem to me, and that is the representation and storage of information. Um, for a 10-minute exercise, you don't need to store a lot. You store information about the ground you're driving over. But if you think about what, or what an entity would need to operate for 72 hours, it needs a lot more information than that. But the question is, is what do you store? How do you store it? And what are the, the retrieval mechanisms that allow you to uh, retrieve it quickly enough when you need to use it. Um, related to that is the drive now is for smaller and smaller systems that people can put in their back pockets like uh, quad rotors. So how do we optimize the use of both the onboard storage and uh, reasoning capacity and intermittent access to external knowledge stores? You got to think on your own for a while, but then coming back, um, you might be able to ask a question of either a human or another entity. Now, humans are really good at reasoning, and they have a number of different things that they can do that I think we need the technologies that will enable robots to do. And among those are abstraction. That also affects how you store information. If you can abstract it, then you don't have to store as much. Analogy, um, we're really good at making analogies between different situations. Reflection, um, as humans, we often take information we've gained and, and the best example of this is going through college classes. You've gained a lot of information through the day, you go back and you reflect on what you learn to make stronger connections and to be able to create new knowledge that wasn't there before. Uh, right now, our systems don't create new knowledge and that's, that's a problem. Um, other things that um, humans are good at that robots need to be good at are things like sequencing and spatial reasoning. Uh, right now, they, they identify things in the world but they don't really relate them. And I like to show this picture that's on the, of the lower right side. As a human, you can answer the question very easily. And I want you to ask yourself, what would it take to enable a robot to answer that question reliably or questions like that reliably? Um, like I said, managing memory is one of my favorite problems because I worked on it for a while. Um, what you're trying to do there is you're trying to store information that can support diverse and sometimes simultaneous tasks. And remember that the context is often task dependent. So you can't just depend on context to tell you what to store. You've got to have a good retrieval me mechanism. But some other things that you have to do is you have to be able to update this knowledge. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever worked with sensors, uh, but they tend to be very noisy. Um, LADAR sensors is probably the exception. There's noise there, but they're pretty good sensors, but they don't give you a lot of information compared to a camera. But often we make mistakes we go back through our memory and we correct those mistakes. So we have to develop systems that will allow uh, robots to do the same thing. And this is a blending of 
what I'm calling data science and robotics. There's a lot of information in data science that needs to move forward to these systems, but it needs to um, not depend on large uh, data storage or large processing units because it won't fit on a robot. Um, there's also some lessons from animal and human memory that we can still gain. So, let's see. I do have a project that I'm funding in this area that I think will point out some of the things that we're looking at. And basically, Young, Young Kang Kao is looking at uh, how to develop a deeper understanding of the scene in front of him. And his basic idea is you've got these two different things that grew up in different disciplines. One of them, knowledge graphs, basically contains an ontology of information that relate words to each other. Scene graphs are vision-based and they re relate objects to each other in a spatial manner. So his idea is the following, is what if you could combine these two types of graphical information together um, what would that let you do? Well, it'll let you do two different things. Number one, it could allow you to correct some of the labels you might have on the objects by using the knowledge graph. The other thing it'll allow you to do is possibly make connections between objects that are either not currently in your field of view or connections that you might miss between objects. What that gives you is a much deeper understanding of the world as it exists. The other thing you can do if this is arranged in a hierarchical structure, you might be able to develop um, labels at different levels. For instance, uh, you might be able to um, take a group of rooms and label them together as being, I don't know, a factory area or a storage area because of the nature of what's in those rooms. Uh, other cases, uh, you know, you, you might be able to look at a scene and tell that it's from the, uh, from the uh, contents, that it might be a playground area or uh, one of my long-term goals is, can you tell where people have used the objects around them in a non-traditional way, such as maybe put stumps of trees together to hold a meeting outside by looking at the, uh, the relationships between the objects. Within learning theory, methodology, and techniques, I'm really trying to push on online or continuous uh, machine learning. So think about a lot of uh, reinforcement learning, but also new things that are coming online that will allow you to do online learning and to gradually gain information over time. You might encounter new classes, you might encounter new tasks that you need to solve. Um, but some of the issues in this area is, particularly for robotics, we we need the concept of safe online learning. Um, often you don't completely explore your environment because some parts of your environment uh, could cause injury. We need to be able to develop this concept of safe online learning for the robot so that it can explore, but it also has constraints on it. Um, intrinsically motivated learning, uh, if the robot is presented with a problem in its space, what motivates it to learn a solution? Um, which means you can't program it in. You know, you might be able to program in the motivation, but you can't necessarily program the exact steps in. Uh, I still think we need a theory of few shot learning. There are people who use uh, few shot learning, which uh, relies on very few samples but we don't have a good theory that underlies that. Um, the Army labels its data problem with the following. The, the data is dynamic, it's dirty, and it's deceptive, and it's dinky. In other words, they don't get a lot of data. Um, what they do get 
uh, is, is uh, very dynamic, it's changing all the time. It's dirty in that we probably connect, uh, collected it from sensors. So it's got a great deal of uncertainty involved in it. And there's people who are trying to keep us from solving the problem. So it can be deceptive. Um, another area I wanna push on is multitask learning and generalization. Uh, in an, in a long-term environment, robots are not gonna be doing a single thing. They will be doing multiple things. Um, I've used the term neural networks and I, I think most of you are familiar with them, but just, just for those of you who are not, um, basically a neural net is a mathematical function that maps uh, input like uh, the pixels in an image. Um, to functions that are arranged in an order that's somewhat um, related to the human, the human brain. Okay, each of the each of the dots that you see in the uh, the upper left picture is an activation function. Um, we can talk about different kinds of activation functions, but I don't want to do that here. I just basically it's a it's a mathematical function uh, that maps images to labels in this particular case. And generally the way people train these things is they throw lots and lots of data at them uh, with all kinds of different classes and they train the weights to give the best, best performance for all the classifications. So ask yourself, well, what if you don't get all the classes at the same time? Can you use neural networks in an online setting? Well. Neural networks suffer from a problem in the online setting called catastrophic forgetting. And you can train it for something new, but you run the risk of not being able to go back and respond to classes you already knew. So I have a researcher that's looking particularly at this catastrophic forgetting problem. And his approach is, is, okay, let's redesign the neural network. So what he does is he's created these things he called learn to grow networks. And basically for every layer in the neural network, he, he makes a choice for every new class he encounters. Um, he can either keep the layer the same if it's sufficiently representative of the sample. He can modify it a little bit uh, by changing a few of the weights, or he can simply replace it. Now, if he couples this with um, something he's calling a supernet, what he's able to do is create a system that stays bounded. It doesn't develop a new net for every new class you get, but it addresses the, the catastrophic forgetting problem pretty well. The other thing it does is it allows for efficient reuse of information for new classes. So both of these are wins uh, as far as being able to look at something long-term. Assured operation really has two parts. One is test evaluation verifications. And this needs a lot of research. Um, it's basically a very nascent field and we need rigorous theoretical underpinning and practical tools in this area. Um, I worked with people at the Aberdeen Test Center, which is another organization up at the Aberdeen Proving Ground. And the way they like to phrase it is, is they used to just be able to test vehicles. And they developed beautiful courses for testing the mechanics of the vehicle. And they could tell you how reliable it was. Uh, unfortunately, now we're asking them to test the vehicle plus the driver. And it's, it's almost equivalent to giving a learner's per permit to a teenager. Uh, now, not only that, but since the advent of online learn, or not even online learning, but just learning in general, we're asking it to not only test the driver, but test a driver who's constantly changing and predict how reliable that system is and how, how much the government should invest in such a system. 
There's another way to look at assurance though, and that's from the robots perspective, which I'm more interested in this, but I'm still interested in uh, test and evaluation. Um, basically for long-term operations, robots have to be able to do a couple of things that humans can do. One is they have to recognize and respond to failures because they're going to occur. Uh, part of this is they have to be, they have to have the capability of self-evaluation. Um, you, you're constantly testing your own performance, whether you, whether you're doing it consciously or not. Um, but the, uh, a good analogy is look at a, look at what happens when you learn to hit a baseball. Is you tested your performance with every hit. We need a robot that can do that as well. How well am I doing and should I change things? Um, we also need to develop systems that are fault tolerant um, and can adapt to new situations because one thing that happens with mechanical systems is they break down and they may not completely break down, parts of them may break down. And in that particular case, the mission could continue. Uh, let's see. The other thing is, is uh, the world's uncertain and robots have to be able to deal with it. Uh, and then the last thing is, uh, artificial intelligence is developing a lot of uh, cool techniques and stuff like that, but be able uh, to be able to put them on a robot, we need close to real time performance. And that's really tough for small systems. I do have a couple people who are addressing that though. I'm gonna talk about one of them here, give you an idea. Um, basically, deep neural nets, there, there's been articles out recently that talk about the amount of energy deep neural nets consume both in the training and in the uh, inference phase. Uh, they're not very practical for small systems. And here, think about quad rotors. Think about the amount of computing power you can afford to put on a quad rotor and expect to be able to do anything. So what Yancey Yang is doing is he's saying, okay, uh, one important technique in neural, in neural networks right now is pruning. Pruning is often used to make the network as safe as possible and for, to prevent uh, intrusion, to prevent um, any sort of uh, tampering with the network. You, you eliminate unnecessary nodes in the network. But there's a couple different types of pruning that are out there right now. Unstructured pruning gives you the greatest degree of, of compression, um, but it leads to inefficient computations and very long inference times, which doesn't, it's not very practical for real world applications. Structured pruning, on the other hand, does lead to efficient computations depending on how you set, set it up. But unfortunately, what you're doing is you're sacrificing accuracy. So what he's doing in his work is he's developed this method he calls block pruning. And what he's able to do is first of all, map the neural network onto specific hardware and then judiciously choose how he prunes. He prunes within a block, but then uh, for that area, he, he, everything that's in the same space in that block, he prunes that as well. Now, by doing this, what he's able to do is he's able to show state-of-the-art performance at 20 frames per second on a cell phone, which is pretty remarkable. And that's the sort of improvements we need to get things on the, the type of constrained processors that we're likely to find in a robot. Uh, interaction. Um, like I said before, future autonomous systems have to interact either physically in the same space or remotely where there's an offset between entities or even virtually in cyberspace. Um, we have made some progress in this area, but there's still a lot of outstanding issues. One is how do they interact during training? 
um, something that comes up all the time when I talk to my human research and engineering friends is um, what's the effect of the management of faulty or unexpected behavior? Uh, if you're constantly pinging the human, they may tune you out. Um, the other thing, and we, I talked about it earlier today with somebody is in order for the robot to effectively uh, work with humans in its environment, it needs to be able to model human actions, intentions, and beliefs. We've got some work in this area, we need more. Um, in the training area, I've got one uh, researcher, Sriram Natarajan from down in uh, Texas. He's looking at how do we incorporate human advice into the training of a neural network? And basically he's creating this advice gradient that goes directly into the network. Um, but what he's doing is he's collecting preferences. You know, something's a little bit better than the other. And then most of the training is done on these column neural networks that you see in the picture. Um, the other thing he's doing, because he's, he's a data scientist, and he says, you know, you guys in robotics are not using the rich sources of data that are available in structures like uh, relational databases. So he's also trying to incorporate that into his neural networks. Um, I know this was a fire hose. Um, hopefully what I've done is given you a little bit of a desire to work on long-term economy and be able to produce these systems that are a, a, they can work in open environments for extended period of times. Uh, like I said, my key research areas are you know, knowledge representation and reasoning, learning, assured operation, and uh, interactions. Now, what I did is I divided the talk into two parts. So the next part's on opportunities. And for those that are, aren't interested, um, I was glad to talk to you, but I want to start with the students for opportunities. Um, basically, ARL, the Army, and really the DOD are committed to STEM education and supporting um, STEM researchers throughout their career. And at ARL, we have a number of different programs, both that span actually from high school level all the way up to postdoctoral level, um, where student researchers get to come in and work with Army scientists and engineers in developing um, new product, uh, not new products, but new research areas um, and conducting, and conducting programs. Um, the four programs are, um, first of all, the, the ORAL RAP fellowship program is a relatively new program that they put in place that allows uh, student researchers to be involved in ARL research for more than necessarily a summer. Um, we call them journeymen and they can occur uh, at the undergraduate, the graduate, and the postdoctoral level. These um, individuals come into our labs um, and they're given specific tasks to do under the guidance of a researcher mentor um, to help out with whatever the overall mission of that researcher is. Um, the high school apprenticeship and the undergraduate apprenticeship program is an eight week program um, basically, uh, the mentor in this case has a little more hands-on experience uh, or hands-on uh, interaction with the student. Uh, the journeymen tend to be a little more autonomous in the lab. They're, they've been given tasks to do at the beginning of the summer, and um, they work a little more independently, particularly our graduate level and our postgraduate level researchers. Um, the CQL program, I don't ever really understand the difference between it and the, uh, and the uh, 
the URAP program. <laughs> so they're approximately the same, but we use them, uh, we use them interchangeably. Now, uh, as a student, you can apply for any of these programs. Um, you might want to drop me a line. Um, you won't be working at the Army Research Office because we're a funding agency, but up at ARL um, in Aberdeen and Adelphi and even our satellite campuses, uh, we're constantly using students to help out with our research. Um, one of the things with the eight week programs, it gives you experience of not only doing research, but also presenting research because at the end of the summer, you're expected to present uh, your research findings and there's actually a competition. Um, you, can, you can gain money from doing that. Um, the last thing I wanna mention, and I really uh, suggest that you go to the, the website and look this one up, is the arm uh, the DoD also offers scholarships for STEM students, and basically it covers the last year or two years of whatever level of school that you're in. So uh, for undergraduates, it'd be your senior year. For masters, it's your last year. For PhD, I think it's also your last year. Uh, this is a competitive program but it gives you an opportunity to get a full scholarship plus uh, a stipend for books. And I think it includes room and board, but don't hold me to that. Okay, look at the website. Uh, again, I've included some uh, websites at the bottom that you might be interested in. Uh, Dr. Finkel, I sent you a brochure that you can include on the website to share with the students about these programs. Now, funding opportunities. Uh, within ARL, we, uh, we run a number of different funding opportunity. Uh, our most common is our single investigator grant. Uh, this is really a misnomer. Um, you can have more researchers on, on the grant if you want it. It's a three year, approximately 100 to 150K per year grant. Um, our short term, Innovative Research Grant uh, really supports ideas that are not quite ready for the single investigator grant. So if you have, if you have something you want to try out and you can put together a pretty good white paper, uh, we can look at the short-term innovative research. One of the, the differences between the programs is the single investigator grant is reviewed by three academic um, professionals plus a army scientist. Uh, for the short-term research, we, on, uh, we only require one academic review. So the turnaround is usually quicker. Um, as I've told people earlier today, uh, I, am a I do work for a government funding agency and when we get our money depends on what happens in Congress every year. So I don't have a lot of control over that, but I do accept white papers throughout the year. And I do try to get them reviewed as fast as I can. I can only fund them when I have funding. Um, our year starts in October, but that's not necessarily when, I, when we get our funding. Um, you all may have heard of multi-university uh, research initiative. What this program does is it uses a collaboration between multiple disciplines to get at a, after a project that we're interested in. Okay, um, generally as program managers, we're the ones uh, promoting, excuse me, proposing those, uh, but you know, I'm, I listen to ideas from everywhere. A um, couple other programs, and I did put it on the website. Uh, early career program uh, used to be called Young Investigator Program. If you're within five, and I have to look it up because I think it might have changed to seven lately, is if you're within five years of your PhD, uh, it's possible that we can fund you under this early career program. Uh, that could lead to a presidential early career award or a P case for scientists and engineers. 
um, which is a little more money, and I believe it's a five-year program, so five years worth of funding. Something else um, that's that we try to to push is a competitive program for, and we call it the Dura program, but it allows you to get instrumentation for your laboratory. And in this particular case, most of the time we're talking about buying robots and GPU servers to do um, research on, on uh, machine learning algorithms, okay? Uh, you can apply to that. I think we fund about 300K per laboratory on those. So that, a um, couple of things to point out is number one, uh, there's a website that tells you a little more about ARO in general, just in case your work doesn't fit within my program. Um, the other thing is, is I strongly urge you to look at our broad agency announcement because it contains the latest and greatest description of each of our programs. And those websites are both included at the bottom. Now, how do you work with a program manager? Well, first of all, look at the broad agency announcement. Identify one of the, PA, uh, the program managers you want to work with and describe your idea in a white paper. For me, I like to see three to five pages with a, with a description of what you're going to do, how it relates to the um, literature out in the field, and um, an idea of your funding. Okay. Email that to me or another PM. And what's, what's going to happen then is there will be a, a round robin of conversations. I'll read the uh, paper and I'll think some of it's good, but I might want you to modify some things and we'll go round and round on this. Um, particularly for young researchers, this is useful. Eventually, if it's, a, it's a agreeable to both sides, I'll ask you to submit a full proposal. We'll go through the review process and hopefully we'll um, result with a, a funded proposal. Now, one thing that I've got to warn everybody about is this requires patience, okay, because of the nature of, of government funding, okay? So, this is an eye chart and a half, but the Army identifies research priorities that it's trying to pursue. Um, some things that are most interesting to me is artificial intelligence and autonomy are both research priorities for the Army. But there are other areas here, such as quantum uh, and that computing, um, synthetic biology. So other people might be interested in this. So this is a high level description of those areas and you might want to look at that. Now, uh, one thing I want to try to convince you of is you do not have to make your problem strictly relevant to the Army. In fact, keep your Army and uh, keep your, uh, your research in the domain you're comfortable in. It's part of my job to see the connections. I may suggest things to you, but that's something that I like to do is I like to make the suggestions of how this could be more Army relevant. Um, one question I was asked earlier today is, are we making killer robots? Or one discussion we had today was, are we making killer robots? No, not really. Um, weaponry is a very small portion of what we're doing. Uh, there's a lot of missions that have absolutely nothing to do with weapons. So keep that in mind if the idea of putting a weapon on a robot um, bothers you, it bothers me too. Um, I'm more interested in what does it take to move effectively, see effectively, and understand effectively. Um, I'm going to go through these really quickly. They're in your packet. This gives you an idea of some of the types of thrust we have within each of the areas. These are the computing science ones. Um, one of the things, modeling, simulation, and visualization is run by my buddy, Mike Coyle. 
uh, under computational architectures and visualization. Um, knowledge systems sort of touches on some of the uh, uh, same topics that I do, but it focuses on how to get the information to the human. Uh, we have a program in network sciences. And again, let me leave, leave this for you to read. Uh, we also have a program in mathematical sciences that's focused primarily on uh, complex systems and biosciences. And that's the extent of my talk. Um, I hope I, I provided you some good information about how to work with us. Um, I'd be glad to take email, uh, take questions now, but emails from anybody who uh, has questions later. Sure, um, if anyone has a question. This is a good time to uh, to raise it. We have uh, some time because we have no second to talk today. Let me ask ab about how big is your total uh, budget for grants in comparison to the National Science Foundation? We're a drop in the bucket. We're we're about a million to two million, and that's our total budget for the year. <laughs> Which um, means that if you're giving our grants, my program. Yeah, so grants of 100,000, you can't make very many of those. Right, right. So I have to judiciously grow the program. And by the way, the program's fairly new. I've only been at it for a year. So, I mean, holes that I see, uh, interactions definitely a hole, um, but there's always room in, uh, uh, knowledge and in um, learning for new projects. Other questions? I have a I have a question. Uh, this is Jane Hayes. Thank you so much for your interesting talk, Dr. Fields. We certainly appreciate the, the time that you spent with us today. And I know Dr. Ware and I really enjoyed our time chatting with you. So this is a broader question, not just about, about your particular program there at ARO, but I'm wondering if you could comment on what you think are some of the, the serious challenges that will be facing uh, these autonomous uh, endeavors in the future. Well, one of, the, one of the challenges I see is this concept of an open world where you don't know what comes next. Um, humans are just so good at dealing with that. Um, we, don't, we don't have robotic systems that are that good at dealing with truly open situations. Um, I think it's going to become challenging to work in the context of a team that consists of cyber assets like robots and humans, because they have such different skill sets right now. You know, and um, I always think the long pole in the tent is perception. Learning to see and understand the world is very hard. Thank you. I have sort of a practical question. Um, so some groups like the NSF have very strong uh, preferences for funding, for example, graduate students over other things like faculty and equipment. Uh, do you have any preferences in that area? Like, you know, if you say, okay, target budget 100K, do you have specific places you like that money to go to over others? Uh, one, one of the restrictions is you can only spend a small amount of the money for a regular single investigator grant on equipment, and you can only spend a small amount of the money on travel. After that, um, I, I will frankly tell you that I'm too new at this to really know if I have a preference, but 
uh, the typical thing is, is people will, will fund summer salary for themselves and they'll usually support a graduate student or possibly even some undergraduate students. So um, one thing I haven't seen, which has surprised me a little bit, is I don't see too many people funding postdocs. But and that's- Do you awesome. usually look for multi-year projects or do you have like an ideal timeline? Is it like, oh, you, you want five years or you want six months or? Our, our single investigator program is a three-year program. So that's, that's most of our funding. Uh, the shorter, the, the innovative research program is usually around nine months, although I, can, I think it can stretch to a year. The longer term program we have is the MURI. And those, those are special cases because you have to apply to a MURI topic. And they're usually five years with the possibility of extension. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, I will be posting a copy of the slides and the brochure that Dr. Fields refers to, uh, which is especially aimed at students who might be interested in following some of these opportunities. So those will be on the Keeping Current website. And let me invite you all then to our talks next week, where we'll have uh, Brent Harrison and Tyler Burke talking about um, two very different things. Uh, the first of those, actually, an overview of machine learning is something that I'm looking forward to because I don't know anything about it. and It's become very popular in the last 10 years. So come one, come all. Uh, and Dr. Fields, you're invited, of course, to any of our events if you <laughs> feel like coming. Um, so thank you very much for, for uh, showing us uh, these interesting aspects of the Army Research Office and uh, hope to uh, stay in touch. And thank you all for attending. See you next week.